So welcome everybody. Just as a start, we are live on the air with this conference, so many others are virtually with us, but to, now they are not yet virtually with us. Almost there, and that's the reason why we are a little bit delayed. We wanted to just um, explain to you that as we are trying to make it possible for as many people as possible to uh, be here with us, we need your patience for a little more moments so that we are on the air and then we will start officially. <laughs> Wow, that was really a few moments. So, Marta? <laughs> okay, so thank you so much, uh, all of you, for being here with us in this very special moment. We think it will be a uh, learning and sharing uh, experience. That's what we want to be this day. It was also what happened uh, yesterday. Um, in the name of the municipality, that they can be here right now, they were yesterday with us, uh, and in the name of the Entrepreneurs Association of Guadiana Valley, I want to thank you, thank you all of you for being here. We have been here with students, with farmers, with many institutions, people that are interested and of course, to, to, to thanks to, to Ernst Ketsch, his family, his team, for this journey to, to here, to everybody uh, that uh, came with him also, but of course, to the Life in Syntropy group, uh, Diana Andrade and Philippe Pazzini. They are living with, with us here in Mertula. They come to Mertula for sharing with us this dream that we have uh, to restore this landscape by using and using well. Okay, so thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I also want to thank to Katarina Serafimova. She really uh, have been a, a strong uh, help and friend uh, for all of us. And well, it's <laughs> without you, probably nothing of this would be happening uh, right now, these, these two days. And also to Matthias, thank you so much for all your help. Uh, of course, to my team in the Entrepreneurs Association, they, uh, Luis and Nuno, I don't know where is he, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for all your effort and patience for me. <laughs> Uh, of course, all the team of the municipality and the municipality that have been support uh, all the strategy behind uh, of this, this process, the Food Network Academy. Uh, but also important for all of this happened, we, we, we had the help of some foundations like the Leopold Bachmann Foundation, Salvia Foundation and also uh, Lush. Um, I think... Oh, and I will not forget, of course, we'll have uh, in the afternoon some inspiration moments. And for that, I, I will thank to Rita de Cassia, uh, to Matias, to the Grupo Coral de São Domingos. Uh, uh, it's a traditional core. Uh, and to Patricia Moura. So I hope you enjoy. Okay. And I will pass to Catarina to explain more or less what will happen today. Thank you, Marta. Yes. Welcome to this part to this part of the journey so we will start now and learn more about how to restore the land while using to understand ecosystems and landscapes and make them to areas of permanent inclusion i think this was what i learned yesterday um, and we will start now we will have a coffee break at around 10 um, 45 and then we will continue until lunchtime and after lunch we will start again here um, at two o'clock. Lunch, I think there are some leaflets outside to know where there are the good places in Mertula. It's all very close and it's beautiful to have a little walk through the historic town and I'm sure that you will find a good place. So two o'clock then back here and I think then we will announce everything that will happen from there on. So now I would like to invite the team of Life in Syntropy to uh, guide us through the day. Diana and Felipe. Thank you very much for coming. Sorry for the delay. We are uh, a lot of emotions in the technical side. We got here early, everything was fine, and then it wasn't, and then we were like very stressed there. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks about this. The, the reason we decided to do this conference in English is because we have uh, a huge crowd 
of people who started following Ernest Goetz's uh, uh, teachings and the way he sees uh, uh, agriculture. And, uh, and those people, they, they always asked us that they needed some, some material in English as well. So uh, we, we are doing our best to translate everything that we publish on Life in Centropy. Uh, but also it's nice to, to see and to, to listen to Ernest to speak in English, his interpretation, his reflections uh, on agriculture. And, and that's why this is for the audience in English. And we have here a camera. We have a huge crowd that uh, uh, is watching us online. Thanks very much for your support. And today we are going to do, this is the second day of the conference. We had a beautiful day yesterday. And today is going to be a little bit different. I think Ernest will explain this. He, he says he, he's not so much comfortable with monologues. He likes dialogues. So he will do some introduction and then he will love to interact since the beginning with you people. So uh, you are here to put him against the wall and throw your questions, throw your, your, uh, everything that comes to, 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 to your mind regarding this kind of agriculture, every doubt. And, and let's promote a beautiful debate. The idea of, uh, of doing this conference since the beginning was to recreate, maybe we were, we were inspired by the conference that Rudolf Steiner did in the 20s of the last century. So we are trying to do a modern version of it. And uh, it is very nice to hear Ernest's teachings. It's not only in the fields, but uh, we always say, as Ernest always says, this, this kind of farming is not a recipe, it is a process-based agriculture, not an input-based or a product-based agriculture. So uh, the philosophy uh, behind it is as important or more important than the technique itself. So the, the narrative that Ernest built and his interpretation of the ecosystem is a kind of uh, a place where we can go to, to, to find answers. So in order to do that, it's good to understand what there is behind it and the, the, the thoughts that there is behind it. Okay? Just, just to add that for people online, the questions are open as well. I'll be on the chat talking to you. Yes, yeah, sorry for the people online. The, the technical problem was because we, we had a link and we lost the link and now we have it again. And the chat is open. Please send your questions. And uh, we are, uh, Diane and I will try to mediate everything. Okay, so no more waiting. Please, Ernest, come to the stage and join us. Thanks. Uh, uh, let's go. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your assisting or coming. Uh, I hope it will be uh, a nice and enjoying day. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Felipe told now, I'd like to have a more a type of dialogue instead of monologue, uh, which at the same time is what in ancient time had been done as long as men didn't behave uh, as autista, because an autista, he needs a lot of time to give his monologue, and then <laughs> he closes his, eye, his ears and eyes and goes away. Okay. I like I like very much a dialogue and uh, whatever it is, I like also uh, challenging questions. Let's say for me it's more enjoying even. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the day. First, I uh, a deep thank. Oh, let's say yeah, deep thank to organization and a very deep thank to the couple Philip and Philippe and Diana for their. Uh, 15 years long work they have done uh, registering and uh, bringing it to the world what I'm doing trying to interpret and bring it to the world and uh, the most of it is they do it by uh, finance by themselves they're financed <laughs> working doing other jobs in order to get money in order to do this job this is not uh, always simple yeah and it's not always easy so a deep thank for their uh, work, big work they have done. And <laughs> a deep thank to 
my partners who have accompanied and helped me, assisted during 40, 45 years. This is Renata. During 45 years, she struggled with me to construct what uh, I'm doing, what we're trying to bring to the world. And since 15 years, uh, Simara, who is living together with me and day to day, she's working in the field, on the field, and accompanying me, and she does, uh, she has an important role in uh, uh, administering my, my uh, yeah, myself, <laughs> administering, trying to, to organize things so that they will function, they can function, and then at home also doing a lot of work in a farm, because uh, for me, the act of producing, let's say, being a farmer, is gives me the energy, and it's the press, the uh, uh, it's yeah, the, how it's called. It's it's uh, uh, important that without that, I can't, uh, I couldn't do what I'm doing. That I whatever I develop, new I test, not once, test three, throw five times, ten times. A thousand times in order to see if it is or not. And the hypothesis, that is the theory behind, is not the theory first. Uh, this is the conclusion uh, of what I'm doing. And then once having a, a conclusion or believing I have a conclusion, I test it once again, and not once again, uh, uh, several times in order to see, to test if it is or if it not is. And so if I, when I give you first now, or try to give first now the philosophical and uh, functional and ethic, uh, ethical um, base of my uh, fundament of my work, so it's not theory, it's a conclusion out of 60 years of intensive working and 40, 40, 43, 44, 44 years now doing what I'm doing, which I began in Switzerland. And uh, it was in reality the conclusion out uh, of the work I did at that time of plant improving, of plant improving uh, where you try to create varieties, genotypes adapted to the conditions we offer to them, let's say resist, tolerant and resistant and productive uh, genotypes or varieties. And doing that after bringing to the, to the market after two, one, two, three, four years, they have the same problems as the former one. We try to substitute, that to say, we, we try to improve or to, to give a better um, version of that. Uh, and this, I came to the conclusion that say, our, the conditions we offer every year are being worse. Let's say we have managed in the last 70 years to decrease the soil conditions uh, for hundreds of percents that we had at that time uh, after World War II, still it was uh, normal to have at least three, four, five, or six percent of organic matter in the soil. But nowadays, half a percent or one percent is usual, and every year a little bit worse. And this lack of uh, organic matter in the soil. Uh, causes the, uh, yeah, it brought to the breakdown uh, of the immune system of, uh, of nature, let's just say, of, of Earth, because we have no, we don't consider the, the fungus, the fungal uh, vegetation in the soil, which is pre, uh, pre, uh, preconditioned that our plants uh, are healthy. Uh, I will enter in this. Uh, uh, aspect a little bit later. Well, but first now, I'd like to point at the principles uh, which are fundament of my work. And once again, the principles, they are conclusions uh, out of what I've done during the last uh, 50, 60 years. And it's not the theory, and, and then to be tested, it, no, I have tested it, I've live, I live upon, and I've tested it in different ecosystems, and every day they're testing what, as I say, a, uh, 
<coughs> using these principles, they are fundamental for my production. And my production has to be uh, at least uh, comparable, let's say, the same height as those of the region of the same, uh, of the same cultivars of the same species. And if possible, to lower, at lower costs. And if possible, not only if possible, precondition that I could do it, uh, at the same time, uh, improve improvement of life condition of the soil, let's say more organic matter, more life in the soil, and more vigorous plants every year it passes, let's say, after each harvest. I'd like to have this uh, by uh, effect. Uh, additionally, to a good uh, harvest, a better soil, a richer place. So uh, this is a guarantee to, for, for next year to uh, have success too. That is a bit to, to be successful too, and it's something like uh, life insurance. Let's say, doing that, you need more, no more life insurance because you can afterwards, once having uh, deciding to retire yourself from the activities, you can give it without uh, be ashamed or without uh, uh, depth behind. Okay. And so, first, the, the main principles, please. Yeah, this, this is uh, more or less, these are the principles. I will not read now all of them, uh, but uh, I will try to uh, explain or tell it in English. I will publish it also in English. I have it done in Portuguese, written in Portuguese, and here is a, a translation to, to, French, uh, to French. And soon uh, there will be a, a tradition to. Uh, Translation to, to English and to German. Okay, and so the first one is uh, fundamental. Uh, all are fundamental. Uh, I consider life as, let's say, I see in life the, a strong instrumentality. Let's say it's not, life is not here on earth by incidence. And uh, here, in order to, to uh, uh, ex exploit, resources. It is here to create resources and it is here to realize tasks and to fulfill function. And so uh, it's part of an instrumentarium planet Earth created for itself in order to realize his tasks, his fulfill it, his, its, its function in the solar system and in the galaxy. So uh, all this function, I don't see anything uh, which would be by incidence uh, on, the, on this universe. All is, is logic, all is clear, and all has its, its uh, function, it's all is functional. And so this uh, life too, life is part of an instru instrumentarium which planet Earth has created for itself some four billions years ago, and in order to uh, realize its uh, its tasks, its to fulfill its function, and one of the of what we see of life, that is which is visible, life, uh, the uh, one of the byproduct of the metabolism of life is that it organized uh, water. Let's say it created this the uh, system of circulation of water of of sweet water on the planet, not only on the planet, also in different spheres. If we would take off or kill life on this planet, water would return to the planet and it would be uh, similar to Mars, to, to Mars or to other uh, planets, but very similar to Mars. And so uh, it has uh, a clear function and this, at the same time, uh, I see the circulation of uh, uh, sweet water on the planet, it corresponds for me 100% of the circulation of system of blood in our body. We have the rivers, which are more or less the venous uh, system, and we have the, uh, the groundwater, uh, which is the arterial uh, system, and then you have the cells, uh, where one is linked to the other. And so it's not necessary to irrigate 
and it's not even intelligent to irrigate. No, uh, taking water from a uh, Venus system, let's say from river and, and uh, creeks, no, uh, from the groundwater, groundwater taking from groundwater, it, kill, it will kill the system upon, and taking from the, uh, from the uh, river system, it will poison the, the, the life. And it's also even uh, either intelligent to think in about making uh, a place as this is uh, uh, lakes and other things in order to retain water, what we are doing worldwide. It's not intelligent because if we did it, then we, we did this in our body, we would die. That's so we'd have serious problem and afterwards we'll die. And this is what man uh, has done and is doing since 12,000 years. And each time, uh, or each places where he's, he did this, he's, this, he earned or got as a result of this the desert. And then uh, a second, uh, well, this is this uh, uh, a functional, it's a functional part. And then species, each species which appears, it appears equipped to realize its tasks and to fulfill its functions. And it appears equipped to do this, moved by inner pleasure. It's not obliged to do it. It does it by inner pleasure. And doing it by inner pleasure, this is fulfilling its function. This uh, gives him or it to it energy. And we could think uh, in the same way to us, what's our function? What is function? What could be the function of modern man on this planet? My interpretation is the following. Man is something like a rudiment. Uh, a, a lost species, that is a, a leftover uh, species which occurred. Modern man, uh, the modern form of man, occurred some 30,000 years ago. 30,000 years ago, it was the driest uh, spot in the last, uh, the, the, the coldest time and the driest time of the last icy period. 88% uh, of the actually habited and at that time habited places by men off on the planet was steppe. And so man is a, an animal of steppe. And later, 23,000 years later, he lost with a big change which happened from at the end of the last ice period in the beginning of this uh, <coughs> warm a period, he lost his ecosystem. He lost his, his uh, yeah, he lost his ecosystem. And uh, instead of trying to find, which would be a possibility, trying to find, it's his place and his function, a new function, and be useful, serviceable in a new ecosystem. He was is trying. He tried up to now. He's trying to get rid of the forest. And this getting rid of a forest in all civilization is being uh, considered as one of the big uh, um, victories of man. You read uh, victory, you start, uh, history, written history, and study written history. The, <coughs> the, uh, th this act is being considered as one, let's say, the axe and other implements to do that fire, to do that. It's being considered as one of the signs of his intelligence. It's part of his, it's a, his intelligence, but it's an intelligence which is not using the, the potential of our, the whole intelligent, intelligence. It's an intelligence of one side of our brain, the left side uh, only, in, in looking, let's just say, yeah, uh, looking how to resolve a problem, not looking why. It is in this way, and uh, the, the idea behind this. But for doing this, uh, it, uh, removing these forests, he entered in, in conflict with ecosystem problems, uh, lack of water, lack of, of uh, food, and lack of other resources, which by its side uh, caused conflicts, and conflicts uh, uh, go, or that's to say, later on, the increase and intensify and go to war. And war 
uh, causes bankruptcy, and bankruptcy uh, results in death. But this war, uh, war is told to be the father of all uh, inventions, of all things. Yeah, is the father of death, yeah. Uh, but not the, the father of all useful inventions. It's the father of the, the inventions of uh, destroying, let's say, of, of uh, movement against life. And so we could, we should perhaps think, let us try to figure out in a different way to be. Well, later on, I see that, as I told you, all of them, or each species which uh, occurs, is equipped to realize its task, to fulfill its function, moved by inner pleasure, and realized and equipped to, to communicate with all the other ones. The, all the other ones. We, nowadays, we are no, law, no, law, uh, no more um, capable or able, or we, don't, we decided to do, not to do this, because we believe, we believe we are the intelligence. And so it's clear, for being or believing that we are intelligence, we are no longer uh, able to communicate with plants or with animals, because we don't speak English. No French, no, no Spanish, no Portuguese. And so, uh, logically, they are not intelligent and behave in a different way. And so, they are not intelligent. But this believing to be the intelligence, this is disastrous. Now, the intelligence, this is disastrous. We are part of a macroorganism. And this has been told to man some 2,700 years ago by uh, Esopos. He told to man, well, as uh, Kronos in, this, in his side, who created the creatures on this uh, planet, he also created man. And he told to him, man, I bring you to this place, this be your paradise. Live well, multiply yourself, and occupy the place. Be creative. Subwound conditions only, the laws on which this macroorganism which part you are, we are, macroorganism, which part you are, we are, gods of Olymp, they are given, not, on, not even to us gods. In Olymp, it's foreseen that we, we, that we make our uh, own laws. Okay, macroorganism. And try now, or we could try to do that, that is to leave that to... Uh, act in this way. Then a the further uh, the pillar of this you know, relationship between the beings, I'm convinced, and I act in this way as a farmer, uh, that the inter and intra specific uh, relations in life, they are based unilaterally on unconditional love conditions of unconditional love and cooperation, and not, as we believe, since hundreds of years, and competition. It's unconditional love and cooperation. There is no, for me as a farmer, I don't see any uh, pests and diseases. I see them, but they don't bother me. I see them as integrants of the immune system of uh, life, they uh, help me to improve production and to improve my way of interaction. The only pest which exists in my plantation, which can exist in my plantation, is I. There is no other pest. The only one is I. The only disease, the only problem is I. If I look in this uh, looking at, or using these glasses or this type of glasses, it alters all. I see an insect attacking my, in my case, cocoa or bananas or whatever it, it is, or uh, vegetables. So I ask me, what was the fault? Was what the error I committed that it happened? Because they are integrants of the immune system, and it's easy to to figure out that because you look at all of them and then. Oh, in this uh, situation, it's being attacked, and this not. Here, a little bit, attack, a lot of attack. Ah, maybe that. Maybe we'll test it. Okay. Oh, yeah, no. It's really, it's sad. And if you do it in this way, after a short time, you will 
uh, figure out, oh, or you will be able, you have the tool to change your way of interaction. And so, oh, problems I have also lack of, of nutrients uh, people believe it's our oh, that's to say it's it's my fault to have lack of nutrients because nature it always in all places if you let it by itself it will resolve the problem that's to say it's a question of processes there are species equipped to do the job uh, in terms of plants there are microorganisms that from this it's a fungal and bacterial net uh, work they have in the surrounding of the rootlets, which resolve that problem, organizing uh, the uh, nutrients from the soil. There is no problem with nitrogen. Uh, Eighty percent, nearly, of the atmosphere is nitrogen. It's a question of fix it and fix uh, to grasp it out of the atmosphere and grasp the correct amount in the and make circulation exactly the correct amount. But it's not our problem. This is a problem of, of microorganisms of plants. And we have to, our problem is to interact in a way so that those ones are able to do that. Not uh, doing that. If we were equipped to do that, we would be equipped in a different way. That's to say, we would have the possibility of those uh, bacteria. And they do it much cheaper than we are doing it. And they don't know, they need no, um, petrol nor any energy in order to do that, and they have no they have necessity to, to make for. And uh, well, water, the same problem. I, since 20, 30 years, I tell the people water is to be planted. That's to say, we plant water, uh, which is an aspect which for me it's clear and it's easier. I, I had the privilege, I feel myself. Uh, I would tell 50 times, perhaps, or 200 times uh, this day or during this day, I um, had the privilege because I feel mus myself in a paradise. This planet is a paradise, it's our paradise, it's a paradise of all life on this planet. And all are integrants of the, of the paradise. The only uh, problems, the only hell which exists on this planet is here. Wherever I had the privilege to work, sub-desert, cold places, very cold places, uh, humid, per-humid tropics, each place I came to the, and each place I came to a conclusion, it's a paradise. Uh, I believe that this Mediterranean uh, climate, it's a very special paradise. It's the easiest uh, place to live. And I believe that it's not by incidence that dozens of civilization occurred here in the Mediterranean climate. Perhaps a third of all known uh, civilization of the world occurred here in the Mediterranean climate. Uh, we have food, and abundant food, we would have food, abundant food, and a marvelous place to live in this climate. From the beginning of the agricultural year, which begins exactly now, in autumn time, uh, we have the har last harvest, which is the olives. And at that time, we still, uh, that, uh, yeah, we come the, the first, uh, vegetables, the, which go wild, they are all wild here. You can harvest uh, so-called weeds, leaves uh, of, of uh, uh, herbs and shrubs, winter weeds. They go, with this, they occur as they say, germinate and grow, beginning with the first rain in autumn, which begins maybe end of October, mid-October, they begin to grow. And then in November, you harvest the last fruits. Uh, during the winter time, they, they, they're the progress, progressing. In January, you, pr you prune the, the bulk of fruit trees and some trees upon. So you have a lot of organic matter and you have light on the ground. It's, it's a time you can plant vegetables. At the moment you plant, it should be planted. Grains, wheat, 
euh, Barley, euh, euh, it's called euh, Lentulis, Lens Collinaris, Lentils, Lentils, and Con de Bico, Con de Bico is chicken pea. No? Chickpea. Chickpea. It's chickpea. They are native and natural. That's in the, they are Mediterranean. And they should have been planted now. We have the first strains in, in autumn where we plant them. Uh, if possible, underneath the trees, which have lost their uh, leaves in the meantime, and you can prune them. And so have a lot of organic matter. No weeds. The weed is our, the, the weeds. Uh, on our grains, on our, on our, our, our vegetables. So, marvelous plants. Then in January, February, uh, how, uh, pruning our, um, uh, our fruit trees and also olive trees, you can plant uh, underneath those ones, potatoes, uh, you can plant, you can cultivate tomatoes, plant tomatoes, red pepper, etc., etc. And then you will harvest them in springtime, late springtime, early summertime. In summertime, all type of uh, fruits. It begins with uh, strawberry and ends, as I told you, with uh, olives in October. Every month, a lot of fruits. And underneath, you have the best, you have the spices evergreen, rosemary, etc. At the time they grow there. And then you have other, uh, for your animals, if you have, uh, if you had animals. There are evergreen shrubs and plants too, uh, clover, uh, luzerne, and then uh, some asteracias loved uh, by uh, animals. I, one which I, uh, 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 told me or how it's called, attention was, it's only one, that's the only one, it's, it's only one sample. Is, uh, here is called Dacta in uh, Portugal. It's uh, Anula viscosa. It's evergreen, an evergreen shrub, herb shrub. It lives 10, 15, 20 years. It grows, that is, it's only left over near to the to high roads and other places where there are uh, no goats or, or uh, horses or uh, cattle. Uh, transit. In other places, they are exterminated. They, are, they grow no longer. But you could have them in a pasture. It's evergreen. Root system at least two, three, four, five meters to the side. Let's like say they go uh, very deep and they store water. And they give a lot of flour all the time. And uh, cattle eat them. They do very extremely well. But you don't find it in pasture because uh, the way of managing this pasture is not uh, very intelligent. That is to say, it seems to be not very intelligent, or not seems to be not only seems to be. Uh, we treat these animals. Uh, pardon, please. <laughs> uh, we maintain these animals in prison. Uh, fences, and then they are obliged to eat in a way, or eat things where they don't like to eat, and, uh, and secondly, uh, to eat those plants where they would like to eat, they have to return to eat them once again, once again, and once again, up to the point that they will enter in collapse, that's to say, they, they give no time to uh, recover, that's to say, that, that they recover themselves and uh, copies. They have no time to copies. Uh, and these animals, always our uh, animals, maybe cattle, maybe uh, goats, sheep, uh, chicken, uh, pigs, they all are migrative uh, animals. And chickens, for example, they are not to be uh, raised uh, by themselves. No, they prefer, they all, we all prefer a company, big animals. Chicken, pigs, it's, it's very harmon harmonious. Chicken, cattle, very harmonious. Kittle, uh, horses too, very harmonious. They like these big animals and they accompany this. If you were to have a, a migrative system, let's say, only half a day or one day for each, each cell and only after 30 days return to the place, uh, they would live well, and they would act in a, dif a different way. Let's say they would give time to the plants to copies and produce more food. 
uh, in a way we are doing, they exterminate that, and so uh, they help us to destroy or to deplete the ecosystem. And as we are eating them, they send us in compensation to the hell. Okay, uh, this more or less the, let me see. Yeah, there is another uh, important part, which is, which is ethic. Ethics, I'm convinced and try to act in the same way. Inner and interspecific relations are not only based on unconditional love and cooperation, they are based by, on the application of the, on the categoric imperative of formulated by Kant, by Emmanuel, um, Emmanuel Kant. Act in a way so that you want that the principles submitted to, or submit to, to your interaction uh, would be immediately elevated to principles of universal law. And universal law are applied in you, or act in a way so that you want that the that, uh, not principles would be uh, uh, applied in you, yourself. We would act in a completely different way. And doing that, uh, we would act in a way so that our interaction would be beneficial to the other ones, to all submitted to our interaction, beneficial, to all submitted to our uh, interaction, to all presence uh, of uh, our interaction, and to all influenced of our interaction. This is the minimum, would be a minimum of uh, behavior uh, of ourselves on this world, uh, not trying to exploit, because the other way of trying to grasp, to exploit other ones, this clause is that uh, submitted, it refuses itself, it will not uh, produce, which by itself, by results in scarcity, and scarcity to conflicts and war. The other way, however, so it's uh, acting in, in a, a, a way of uh, unconditional love and cooperation, and in a way you'd like to have be, uh, be treat, or do you like to be treated too? With these results that are submitted to your interactions, it will it will prosper. That is to say, it will do the best it can, uh, which by itself results in abundance. That is in yeah, in abundance. And abundance is a fundament, is a pre precondition for peace. And peace is the way to life. Yeah, we could try to act in this way. Peace farming, future time, and not war farming. Don't look. If you go now back to the plantations, act in a different way. Look at the plants. What are you going, doing good here? What is, what is your marvelous contribution in this place? Try to understand it. You are equipped to understand it. And then you will see, Oh, the one which may be a weed, a, a, a considered weed, it's not, a, it's not a weed. It's growing there because we were not, we didn't consider the function this plant is fulfilling or is realizing or fulfilling and the task to be realized that, that of that species or by that species. We didn't consider that in our concept of design for our plantation. And so, or oh, you accept it, that you adopt it as your uh, ally, or you try to find another species which would, could be more useful for your, this, uh, for, for your uh, purpose. And doing that, you will see that things will improve, will be, be, uh, will be much better. And the same as I told you, I told you with uh, so-called uh, pests and diseases, Look at that, insects or fungus attacking your plants. They will not attack necessarily just from in the beginning, the whole plantation. Only if you did all wrong, then it will attack all of them. But uh, normally it doesn't attack all of them, or the whole plantation. So you have, and if you attack the whole, your plantation, the neighbor, that of the neighbor perhaps, they didn't attack. And so look at, the the way it 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 acted, as I say, the the reasons to to get try to figure out the reasons why uh, that fungus that insect attacks. Oh, 
it seems that there is not sufficient organic matter, or perhaps not shade, no shade. There are many plants we plant in, in open sun, which are not plant, uh, plants to be uh, to, to grow in, op in open sun. Th uh, think in your peach trees, think in your strawberries, think in your uh, potatoes. Potatoes are not a plant which, grow, which loves full sunshine. It has co-evolution with uh, quinoa real. Quinoa real is, is taller than corn, or it's the height of corn. And more or less, at least, not more or less, at least, 15 to 25 percent of the area planted with potatoes should be shaded by a plant like, like corn or uh, uh, quinoa real. Not complicated to, to, to do that. And then it's, it, there should be something different still, or additional, uh, in between, for, for example, sunflower, which could be uh, the, the canopy of your plantation, about 30% or 40% should be shaded by plants similar to sunflower. And then the potatoes. If you did that, you will see that your potatoes will feel much better. They will do much better. Or you can prune trees in, here in the Mediterranean climate in, in January, February, and then you plant trees, put them, uh, plant potatoes, put them on the underneath organic matter. They like a lot. Uh, organic matter, but they don't like being uh, put into the soil, on the, upon the soil, and organic matter upon. They will do extremely well in this way. They will have a nutty flavor, they will have no problem with fungus attack, they will, no, will have no problem with water, and in that context they will, no have, will have no problem with frost in springtime, in our springtime. They will do extremely well in this case, even with it, it, after a very strong frost, which could happen in March or April, uh, they will not die. Maybe that some leaves on the top they will uh, try, but afterwards they will come back. They will come back and they will produce. Then it will be easier to harvest. It's not no longer necessary to to dig the soil. They are on the on the soil and the rest of organic matter upon. And so they they uh, they get they do what by nature would do. They get the the leaf upon the material of it to say the the nutrients uh, and the the substance is produced by the fungus the Basidia mycetes at first uh, first of all which transform which attack that organic matter and then the rootlets of potatoes will go to that and receive in form of macro uh, macro molecules macro molecules. Uh, ferments, vitamins, uh, um, enzymes, and antibiotics, and they will use them in this, in the form they received and uh, integrate in their body, which gives them then health and vigor. And if you'd like, you can transform that operation, cultivating cultivating potatoes, in a perennial operation. The, uh, the, the precondition is having a lot of trees and learn to prune trees at the, at the correct time in order to give them light that, that they need uh, to, to grow in the beginning. And in a way they are growing, the trees will come back and shade. And when you harvest the potatoes, forest is complete once again, rejuvenated. Yeah, potatoes as a perennial operation. Uh, we go into the next one. Uh, let me see principles of life interaction. Yeah. Then we have the microorganism. I told you the last one is the, the last one of those principles is uh, the following consequences of let's say the immune system of the, the functioning of the immune system of nature. The following the interaction the disharmonic inner interaction of parts which constitute a, a macroorganism induces in that macroorganism modifications which result that the present of the emitters of those uh, disharmonic interfer interference interferences will become inopportune, let's just say, they are exposed. This is more or less the 
What happens? What happened? Thousands of time to man. First locally, then second uh, uh, experiments are beginning regionally, later on continentally, and nowadays we are repeating this, the, the big effort to do it globally. Every time, each time, the same, in the same way. The removing forest, uh, planting, focusing on uh, animals instead of by animals. We are the natural and the original ecosystem dominant, actual and the say, original ecosystem on the whole planet. In 88% of the place inhabited by man, even in the Sahara, in, in that which we have, we have transformed in, in deserts in during the last 2,500 years or 2,300 years, Sahara, uh, Atacama, Gobi would be forest. Sahara was forest. Sahara was a savanna in the center, in the north of the forest, an oak forest. In the south, uh, it was a rainforest. And the animals were the guards of Egypt. And the means of transport of the civilizations 2,300, 500 years ago, from Egypt to Portugal, was not realized by on the sea. Not that they would not have been able to do that, but it was much cheaper coming from each of each of the the, the, the place like Portugal, uh, choosing for the southern route, uh, accompanying the let's say between uh, the Atlas and the Mediterranean, because it was a place, it was a savanna, a lot of of elephants and other big animals, and so. The means of transport was elephant, and fuel was free, and sufficient food to eat. And so it was very uh, cheap to do that. Uh, they, they cut the forest, they felled the forest, removed the forest, insisting, and now insisting up to nowadays to remove or to, uh, to avoid that forest comes back. I was invited to make a small experiment or a work in Tunisia some two years ago. And then I asked the organization who invited, which invited me to do that, to uh, guarantee, that is to give me at least a thousand hectares, not to my property, only protect and avoid and make sure that their animals uh, domesticated animals, goats, sheep, dromeda, uh, etc., uh, wouldn't enter. They were not able to do that. Let's say they believe that uh, when there is some green or some dry plant, it's, it has to be eaten by animals, by their animals. And so they came to this place, let's say to a, uh, yeah, to a place to, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, to the place that they are, in my interpretation, no more able to want, which is the deep message of the tragedy of the ancient Greek tragedy of losing your energy, your will to want to do something. That's to say, they decide, that's to say, they have been they transformed. They, they turned from the transformer to the transformed. And so they are working uh, to their suicide, let's say, to their expulsion. For planet, it's no problem. Four billions of years, 2,500 years is nothing. It's one second for its life, let's say. It's, it's no, no problem for for our planet, but it's our problem, let's just say, the question of survival of our species. If we are no more able to want to do that, so it's our planet, we know it's no need to to, to save, or that's to say, to, to rescue the, the planet. planet is sure, it's only need, it's, it, perhaps it would be more intelligent to think how to 
to act, you know, to be allowed or to have still a, a place to survive in this paradise. And we could try to uh, to act in a way so that Mother Earth can embrace us once again, return uh, to, to the paradise, Mother Earth. It would be, in my uh, point of view, in my opinion, it would be worth, uh, worth uh, while to do that, let's say. And it's easy to do that. It's only a decision. Go down. Uh, go down. Let our uh, absurd idea of being the intelligence and accept that we are part of an intelligent system. Well, this is one. Now the next one. Please, the, the, the quadrado. Yeah. I have designed, uh, try to design our actual relation with the planet and as well as here now. Uh, and then try to design uh, an alternative. Uh, this is a um, plea I have to all people, is that it's not, let's say, only to criticize is very cheap and it doesn't resol resolve anything. Please don't criticize your neighbor. No blame your, your reformers, no blame your president of the uh, United States, of Portugal, of France, or of any country, the country you live, nor the mayor on your, uh, in your uh, uh, municipio where you live. Give an example how to do it. This is much more intelligent. And this can have more uh, effect, let's say, we do be more effective, more efficient to do that instead of criticize. And then this had been written in the uh, Bible some 2,700 years ago. You can read the Talmud. There's written, uh, it's, it makes no sense, it's no use to educate. Don't try to educate your children. Don't try to educate your children because they, in any case, will only do that which you, educator, live. Stop criticizing, blaming at once. Do a good example. Then you can be, try to be serviceable, try to be useful and be a good example for your children, for your neighbors, for the president of the republic. Yeah? This is now what we are doing in our uh, in the actual time. We have our, uh, the God uh, is money, and the bank system is a church of modern time. And th this God and the church, they define or it defines what has to be done in industry and what has to be done in society and in, the, in agriculture. And all of them, uh, economy commands the exploitation of uh, the ecosystem and the society does the same thing and technology does the same thing. All pressure upon ecosystem. This is suicidal. If you kill your mother, it's, it's suicide. That's to say, there's no more food, yeah? And so, this, we shouldn't do this. Uh, we could change a little bit. Put the ecosystem, mother, on mother earth, on the top. It defines what is possible in industry, and it defines what is possible in society. And it, is, it defines to what is possible in economy. It's not negotiable. That is not negotiable. This is given the laws on which a macroorganism, which part we are, you are, they are given not even to us gods of the Olymp. It is foreseen to make our, oh, the laws by our own. 
I suppose, 2,700 years ago. So if we did that, so we could have a dialogue between technology, economy, and practice, all of them. And then they will try to optimize their uh, interaction, which would be a little bit less suicidal. Uh, I would tell we could it, do it bit, because a little, uh, uh, perhaps a little bit better even. Next one. Here is the proposal or the suggestion for a future way of interaction. We have once again uh, the ecosystem upon and the ecosystem with the ethics behind, as I told you, unconditional love and cooperation and all equipped to do what each uh, individual to do its task, realize its task and uh, fulfill its function, moved by inner pleasure and acting based upon the, the principles of the um, categoric imperative uh, formulated by Kant. Well, once again, this is not, these laws are this, uh, yeah, uh, these laws, they are not negotiable. I can't negotiate with nature. If I can cut now 10% of 15% or 50% of the forest, let's say, oh, that and then, then take out that and, and put that, this is given. It's, it's, it's no, no negotiation. Uh, this defines what it is possible. I will begin on the left, uh, on the right side. This defines what is possible to think. You no longer would come to the absurd uh, conclusion of capitalism as well as socialism. Both are stupid. Both are stupid. They don't. They, in German, we tell that we that make the the the, the Rechnung on, we machen die Rechnung auf ohne den den Wirt. I have no translation. What you have to translate? Somebody has a translation for this. We make the the, the bill. We are making the bill without the, the the that one who sells us the products. We can't do it. Uh, we have to listen to the to that one who uh, the, who, give, who sells off as the products. Okay, um, so it's very important. We have to. It's defined what is possible to think. Let us see what uh, there is. There was had been written in the same uh, work in Bible. Let us say uh, the fifth book of Moses, which is the so-called Talmud. There is one uh, part tells that be careful with what you are dreaming, because your dreams are the content of your dreams. They will enter in your uh, thinking. Be careful of what you are thinking, because what you are thinking, it will enter in your desires. It will transform itself in your desires. Be careful what you are wanting or your desires, because they enter in your action. And be careful with what you are doing, because they transform themselves uh, in your character. So we have to think about, be careful what you are thinking. And for this, it begins that with philosophy. And we have on the other side, social, and then we have the economy, and we have technology. And in the middle we have the agriculture, uh, that, yeah, we have our, our agriculture. All of them, it's, let's say, between a social econo economy, a social part, society, economy, technology, philosophy, and agriculture, there is a dialogue. Whereas the agriculture, he's the closest to the ecosystem, let's say, he will tell, well, this is possible, this is not possible, as, as long as he is acting using, living the principles, adopting, living the principles given by nature, which I try to define in those Tao, uh, so-called Tao, uh, he will come to the point, well, this is possible, this is not possible. That is, and so for this, I put it in, in the center. It's not because I am a farmer, there's nothing to do with that. Uh, it's only, uh, the position is the closest to nature, but he, he either, 
he has no, uh, it's not, uh, he's not foreseen, he's not uh, allowed to make his uh, own laws because this doing that, he will enter in conflict with the ecosystem and then being expulsed. Uh, well, this could be a suggestion for future interaction of man with nature and looking uh, nature, our nature, uh, universe, planet in a different way, life in a different way. Automatically, man loses his place as a center of a universe. But this is <laughs> a very primitive, primitive uh, and stupid at the same time a way of seeing things. And at the moment that you come to this uh, uh, position or to this uh, yeah, way to acting and to see the universe, you will come to conclusion or you will feel it's all one paradise only. And the only problem or the only, yeah, the center of, of problem is not outside of us, it's inside of us. And it's inside of me, of you. Yeah, uh, this more or less now uh, the ethics and functioning. Now we come to a uh, basic of, uh, afterwards we, I'd like to have dialogue. Uh, first, the basic of what I came to the conclusion after having had now, or having done works, or that is having had possibility, privilege, to work in the most diverse uh, ecosystems, semi-desert, so-called desert, to in uh, Arctic, semi or uh, yeah, sub-Arctic, uh, in humid, uh, uh, well, uh, humid rainforest, tropical humid rainforest, cool temperate, uh, temperate Mediterranean, all places the same. The principles are the same, and the ecosystem. Let's just say the, the way of functioning of the system is the way. Only it's the same. Only the species are different. If I'm working in uh, in the north of Norway, in Tromsø, close to the to the uh, let's just say in, in the um, fjords, close to the sea, north North Sea, it's different. You have four species or five species of birch trees, but they are organized in the same way and functions in the same way and we can do agriculture in that ecosystem in the same way as I do in the tropics. It's very, it's easier even than in the tropic because it's easier to understand less species and so it's much easier. Uh, but you can't plant uh, species there, for example, potatoes two months, which needs two months only to, from planting to harvesting. You can plant them because the birch trees they make the they set leaves before the last snow has gone has gone away has melted away, and so at the moment that springtime it trans, transits to summertime, let's say snow is, uh, has gone away, birch trees are in full uh, leaves that a lot of leaves, and so we could we can do exactly what I do with two here in the Mediterranean climate or in a cool temperate climate or subtropics too. I will prune trees. Uh, plant a lot of trees, and if you have lack of, of uh, if you'd like to have more food, plant more trees in order to prune more to prune more trees. If you'd like to produce more food for big animals, plant more trees in order to prune more trees. They will produce much more. Uh, let's say each tree will produce more. So you can, in that s extreme situation of Norway. You can put the, potato, the potatoes on the soil, prune first the blueberries, which are underneath these birch trees. And if you'd like to, go, to do a good job, you can up to graft better varieties upon those ones which are there. So you can improve them for next year, to have a better harvest next year. And then you prune the birch trees, let them in the skeleton. This makes that you have a lot of organic matter to cover your potatoes on that place. And then uh, the, the elk 
He visits the place too. He has visited the place too. He's a, 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 a marvelous friend of us, a big animal too, 800 kilos or more when adult. And he deposits you his uh, feces normally close to the place where he eats. And if you work together with him, he will deposit a lot of uh, fertilizer for your potatoes. So you will use it and give, you t give it to your potatoes first. And then prune the birch trees. This makes that the birch trees, they will give one month and a half sufficient light to your potatoes to grow because you cut the uh, prune and to uh, come to the skeleton that's the reduced uh, the, uh, the structure to the skeleton of that and then one and a half months later they are full life uh, leaves one ago doing that they increase their growth rate and they invest in new growth and this investment in new growth, they pass the information to your potatoes. And so your potatoes, by information, by fertilizer of the elk tree, and of the elk, I told you the elk he is your cooperator, this is, he's your friend, he's not a competitor, uh, which you had deposited. And then the, the leaves of the branches of the, of the birch trees, the branches of the, of the uh, blueberries you have pruned, you, it will give a lot of fertilizer and best conditions for your potatoes. In autumn time, two and a half months later, you have beautiful potatoes, net, nutty flavor, marvelous. The best potatoes I eat are those ones, which I get from that place. It's marvelous. I don't know that, that I never... Only in, in Bolivia, in 5,300 meters, I have eaten, I have had the same privilege as the potatoes of the same quality as those on. No diseases, not at all. Then, this birch tree, they will have a lot of new uh, branches, branchlets, and they make a lot of new buds. Father, Abundant fodder for elk next winter. He will eat. He will like and love your your uh, uh, contribution, cooperation, no competition. And so he will deposit more, and he will prune them in a way he knows how to do it. He will prune these birch tree, prepare them that so that the, the blueberries next year you have grafted or you have. Uh, uh, pruned the year before. Next year, they will have an extra beautiful harvest, big blueberries, best flavor, best production, low price, no external input. The only or the biggest external input you need to do this type of agriculture is knowledge. And knowledge of peace farming, not of war farming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this first part. And almost as a miracle, Ernest, it was right on spot <laughs> in our break time. Okay, we're going to just like stretch our legs, have some, some tea, some coffee. And when we come back, we start the, the debate, the interaction. Okay, thank you very much, Ernest. <laughs> thank you, Ernest. What time you can... <laughs> You can ask questions. Oh, the first one is already online. Who is it? Alessandro Di Donna is a friend from, uh, he's from Italy. We've been there in Cachinet. They have a very nice project in urban, urban farming. And uh, he's a very dear friend as well. So... We also have some comments from Monica Tata. She was uh, excited with your quote in, in German. <laughs> and she said, yes, let's be the example. 
And now Alessandro de, Don, de, de Dona question is this. Uh, considering the difference between tropics and temperate, temperate climate, you think it's possible to create a sustainable business based, based on syntropic farming? How much manpower needs one actor of syntropic farming? Well, this, this depends. <laughs> it's perfectly possible to do it. And this depends on what you uh, pretend to do, or <laughs> what you have pl uh, planified to do. Uh, I can, if I had syntropic farming, uh, uh, thinking in a cattle operation, or grain operation, it will not uh, take so much, not need so much uh, labor craft as, for example, an intensive fruit operation. If it would, yeah, uh, for grains, it's very similar. Uh, we do, uh, that's to say, I, I'm testing now and we're doing in, in Brazil. I'm testing in Brazil since four years, I'm testing that. And in reality, it's since 10 years, but since four years intensively. Uh, we are limited at the time, at the moment, still on, the, on, uh, <coughs> on machines, not on technology, on, mach on adapted. Uh, adequate machinery. Uh, once again, it's not technology. It's only uh, the ad ad adapt technology to the peculiarities, needs of plants, uh, because the actual machines we have in agriculture, most, uh, nearly all, all of them, nearly all of them, are on the logic of war. Let's just say they have been brought to agriculture from the oh, You look at your tractor. Tractor is, is a stupid uh, implement. It needs at least 2,000, but normally f three, four, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 kilo in order to move uh, a small machine or in order to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to carry some or carry the 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 other push some some uh, a small uh, um, quantity of products. This is disprop disproportional to what we are doing. If we did it the same the same job with an intelligent technology, uh, hooker pack, uh, not uh, not only hooker pack, uh, more intelligent more intelligent way of moving. The same tractor which uh, can will transport at the moment, let's tell, 4,000 kilo. This 4,000 kilo can move instead of uh, needing uh, 2,500 uh, or 3,000 kilo or 5,000 kilo tractor, and then uh, the car behind of 1,000 kilo. You can do it with the, the same 1,000 kilo, or perhaps you get yeah, only 1,000 kilo, or even 500. We are, we, it, it seems that agriculture is married with the production of steel. We have more intelligent, uh, more intelligent the, 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 the stuff or elements or the, or the yeah, stuff uh, to, to use than exactly steel. Steel is useful, but it's not the only one. It's heavy. Uh, we use nowadays carbon fiber. Uh, when a little bit more, yeah, when we try to eliminate, uh, to diminish or use alum aluminum or other uh, lighter uh, materials instead of steel, then wood in in some in many parts would do the same job as, uh, as let's say, yeah, wood would do the same job as, uh, as steel in many, not in all parts, but in many parts, and then the form of traction. Is, uh, too is not intelligent. Uh, we could mo we could uh, modify that. Then machines for planting, <laughs> it's something. Uh, yeah, it's not primitive. It's stupid the way we are doing. We are uh, we have an implement to to to, to uh, divide or to yeah this, uh, divide or to, to to stir the soil and divide the stir. And we, we push it, but it, this is not this is not uh, intelligent. If we, if that person who created that designed designed that it, that person or that uh, would be obliged to do that by hand, he would do it in a different way. I'm sure, because how can you think or how can you imagine that it's intelligent? 
to to take an implement tool in order to 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 make a furrow of uh, uh, of 10 centimeters or 50 centimeters and pull it. It's uh, about a lot of of work. Uh, that is of of uh, energy. Uh, you need you need to do that. Uh, it's in former time when man was more intelligent, and or nature was by itself seeds fall upon the soil, and material, and the organic matter upon. But we have forgotten that we uh, we need organic matter to to produce grains. And so if we had we have now, I'm recommending to plant trees. And then there is another problem to 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 prune trees. Uh, nowadays we have uh, some uh, implements. 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 kilo, and they do, they are not efficient, they are very, and, and they are brutal. That's to say they are uh, raw machines. We can, we have, we have robots, we have uh, 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 light machines, and we could do that. Uh, that's to say more, more efficiently, more rapidly, with a small machine, which perhaps a weight of 50, 60 kilo would do that on the tree, and not step on the soil, on the, on the tree, and for the tree it would be easy to to carry this uh, uh, 50 kilo and the implement doing that upon. Uh, this is on the small hints. As long as we have no, uh, no machines, it will difficult a little bit. But if we, have, if we think in, in horticulture, horticulture, which is, uh, we do it nowadays also in big scale. But even in this, in, in big scale, if you would use uh, organic matter produced by trees, produced by herbs, by perennials, bush trees, etc., etc., and and cut them and put, put them upon the soil. It would be easier, uh, less energy. Let's say we are we are uh, acting upon the logic of death, uh, trying to 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 kill the max the maximum possible and expels uh, all which is life. But the seeds they. The, this, the, all these vegetables, uh, nearly all these seeds of vegetables, they fall on the ground and then they grow. <clears throat> so we could use our uh, intelligence to figure out the consortiums of plants and then uh, do that. Now, another aspect of uh, synthropic farming, I can tell you you need 10 uh, person for one hectare or a tenth or one person for 100 hectare, once again, it's, it depends upon what I'm doing. But another uh, aspect would uh, see, the, that to say we have, in, in the way I recommend to do farming, is the multiple story system. Let's say we have the trees upon to be pruned, which I told you in future time, not very far away, we'll do this with uh, intelligent uh, machines or with intelligent um, uh, robots uh, to do that and then chop up and so we have the organic matter and then you have a second let's say the, the canopy trees apple trees uh, pear trees etc mango or uh, here in the mediterranean climate we have our uh, our olive trees and our almond trees etc canopy trees they, they are nature they are not trees of five of uh, three meters tall as we are uh, raising then, uh, them uh, nowadays, which is not intelligent. They, we, we don't let them to, to develop to their uh, definite height. Think once what would happen if we would, if we would uh, try to uh, maintain ourselves on 110 height instead of 180. Or on one ninety, it's it's it would be very painful, and people submitted to that would not feel them themselves very well. An apple tree, a full fully developed apple tree, is a tree uh, or an olive tree, more or less seven to ten meters tall, and we have uh, implements. We could have, we would have. It would be easy to construct uh, small platforms. Here is a, a, a participant. In the afternoon, he will describe what he is doing to uh, to operate. Let's say for his operation, in the case of banana plants, uh, to to um, put the bags on the protection bags on the on the on the, uh, the bunches of bananas, 
How is doing? It's, it's not necessary. He has a, a, a tall a variety, not a dwarf variety. He has a tall variety, but he has he has, has developed has developed a system which I was uh, just to say I loved. And that's so when I saw it, I was enthusiastic about that. It's a, a dream of of mine to use them for a moment to prune. Uh, that's the operation of harvesting of pruning uh, medium uh, high layer trees. Underneath these apple trees, in former time, when <clears throat> man was less uh, stupid, he planted underneath these apple trees, at least here in Europe, he planted red currants, black currants, and, and other berries. And they did well. Uh, it was the same operation, the price was the same, and uh, <clears throat> no cost for that is on the same piece of land he produced more. Uh, we could do this too. And then instead of uh, killing every year, uh, that's to say planting when ecologic, we plant some uh, fava beans and some uh, 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 barley in winter time. And this then gives so-called ecologically uh, correct cultivated grapes. These grapes would be more happy, would be happier if they could grow upon trees, because this is natural for them. And underneath these trees, we would have still a peach, and underneath the peach trees, we would have some, some here in the Mediterranean climate. Now, some, uh, not only some, we would have a marvelous production of um, pistachio. Yeah. And then the, the, the herbs underneath, it's not the winter. Uh, help which, which we need only. We need, we could plant underneath uh, 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 species which make part of Mediterranean climate, like rosemary and uh, that Inola viscosa. And we could, we should think about Spanish broom, that is about broom, uh, senista. They are, uh, they could be very useful because they would stand without any problem. The, the weight of machines upon, and they would stand without any problem uh, the way the father self to step upon. And they could give us the possibility, or they would offer to us to cut them three times a year and give fertilizer, produce fertilizer for our fruit trees. And so they had a marvelous ground cover to be planted once again, or only once. And in winter time, we could broadcast. Uh, let's say we do, we do that at the moment before olive. Um, the, the olive crop, or crop the, the, the harvesting of olives, we could broadcast some grains, winter grains, upon and cut them. No, no, not those uh, modern winter grains which grow 50 centimeters of height. No, the old varieties, primitive varieties, yeah, of 1 meter 70. And so they would grow, because it's winter time, much uh, faster, more faster than this broom. And the broom after, afterwards, in, in May, June, uh, we could join to July. We could harvest this, the, uh, our grains underneath, uh, and uh, cut the, the the whole system once again. A lot of organic matter be, being produced by perennials. We could look at this a little bit, and so our agriculture in future time once again be farming, not wrong farming, and. So it's not exactly, uh, once again, I tell you, it's not, I can't tell you, it's one uh, labor craft for one hectare. I can only tell you that I, myself, I am a uh, uh, cocoa farmer. Cocoa, farm, cocoa is very labor intensive. And I produce the same amount of cocoa as the best neighbor in the surrounding, which need about one labor uh, this is one, one labor um, first or craft for every three and a half to four hectares. I myself uh, manage in my very complex system 1,500 uh, shade trees per hectare and 1,100 uh, cocoa trees underneath. I spend, let's just say, I myself do that five hectares. I myself. I can tell that, well, uh, I'm a specialist, upon, but I can uh, I tell you, I've, I only spend 50% of my time to do that. The other 50% I'm doing this, uh, this type of work or uh, other type of, of uh, investigation, work which I, I like to, to do. And so it's not so labor intensive because I need not, I have no uh, work with so-called weed control or 
control of pests of our diseases because pests or diseases they exist but they are no problem because I do all in order to avoid the, the, the necessities of their contribution and so I have literally no uh, pests and disease and then uh, I have a lot of organic matter and so the weeds, so-called weeds, which grow, are all favorable to our cocoa. These are some, in, in our case, some uh, um, uh, of the family of the um, ginger. It's uh, hmm. yeah, peraceas and some piperaceas. And then uh, a lot of regeneration of the forest, cutting them. Oh, this is, yeah, a pruning, cutting them once, twice a year is sufficient. To do that, and then the big, the bulk of the organic matter I have to cover the soil are the trees upon, and that operation costs to me a chainsaw and to recut uh, that is a distribute and the, the, to cut them small costs to me more or less twelve a days, twelve days the, the per year per hectare, and so you have an idea about the cost I have for maintenance, this is fertilizing, the cost for fertilizer, I need no fertilizer, for so-called uh, pest and uh, disease control, and uh, yeah, to get, to achieve uh, big productivity. And this, I not only produce cocoa on this place, I the, the, the harvest byproduct, a lot of fruits of the trees in between, there are some, some uh, not only some, cut out of citrus trees and then some jackfruit and some, some other fruits, mangoes and uh, rambutan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, some bananas too. And so I have uh, these fruits free uh, for my own consumption. I don't need them to buy and have special, let's just say, best quality uh, of fruits and best quality of uh, elements for me, which for its side uh, is fundamental to save money to, uh, instead of spending for, for uh, me uh, medicaments and for a doctor, uh, uh, I uh, work a little bit to do a good job. Because in any case, uh, uh, your uh, elements be your medicine. medicines. Who has told that? Your elements be your medicines. Yeah, Hippocrates. Okay, do that. Then agriculture is a beautiful job. Thank you, Ernest. Okay, question here. Ah, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, hello, it's not properly a question, it's more a com commentary. Uh, I think part of the things that I'm going to say uh, will be discussed in the afternoon about scalability of of uh, of this of this kind of systems, but anyway, I, um, my commentary goes. Uh, um, oh, uh, first of all, I work in Edia, which is a company which is developing a great irrigation scheme here uh, nearby with uh, 120,000 uh, irrigated hectares. And uh, usually, when I when I spoke about this in certain places, oh. You are an evil man, you are, legate, you are connected to irrigation, you want to destroy everything, you are evil. But uh, this is not true, as, as you know, here we are in the training. Uh, water is the, 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 key, the key for everything to develop, um, to develop agriculture. And uh, I, I would like to, to, I'd like to know more about scalability, scalability about your uh, systems. And I would like to say that we must produce in a Great, uh, we must produce in great um, quantities, to, to 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 in mass. And uh, in other hand, we must think about there are very good solutions in long term, but uh, uh, you know farmers are businessmen, and uh, they they must have solutions in short term. I I think there are lots of uh, um, agriculture systems in irrigation, and uh, techniques and. Uh, there are good or better techniques and worse techniques. I think that uh, it, it will be a question to discuss which, which are the best, uh, best way to do this kind of uh, irrigated agriculture. But I would like to have your comments. And uh, 
and it, it, it and it is to begin discussion because I, I think even the even farmers in irrigated lands uh, they 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 are businessmen and uh, and of course they 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 want to be alive in short term but they think about long term which are the best practices and what should do should they do yeah uh, I will. I will uh, respond to this question directly and indirectly. Yeah, uh, only a small moment. I am beginning now to uh, show you something. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we have now uh, irrigation, and we have two. We irrigate. We can decide to irrigate the atmosphere, and we can decide to irrigate the earth. We can decide to drink water out of the atmosphere, which plants does. And we can decide to send away water to the atmosphere. And then it happens the following. And what can I do? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's just, sorry. Yeah, uh, we do the following. Nowadays, we do the following. I'm producing, uh, in this case, oh well, we do it in a new way now, uh, do in the same way as you do. So, this is modern agriculture, and this is natural agriculture. Syntropic agriculture, we will have from a moment onward, when our interaction to uh, in nature will have a positive a balance or to achieve a, a positive balance energetically uh, and in terms of uh, established life uh, on your place on the place of our interaction and as well as the balance of the whole planet then we will have centropic farming this is exactly what nature does without our participation it always achieves a positive balance it needs no irrigation it needs no fertilizer it needs no pest control and productivity is very high only we don't see it. that is if we don't see it we don't understand it and our agriculture is all farming uh, but now we are do we will do we will try to show you how or what happens you have here this, and here we have this. And how it functions, I will show you. Now we have here uh, the vortex, which goes from up to down, that is a, a centripetal vortex. Uh, this centripetal vortex, it's cooling down, it's a cooling down. We have cooled down three times. Once we have the trees, the big trees, which we'll have, you will have here, let's tell, 30 degrees upon. And here, down, I have, let's tell, 22 degrees. And here, you have 30 degrees, 30 degrees, 2 upon. And underneath, you have 35 degrees. Degrees. What happens is that always uh, warm, that is a warm place, it takes its expansion and it heats up. And so, water, the irrigate here is going away. That's to say, you have this, you have a centrifugal uh, vortex, it's going away. Oh, I should, no, it's not important. It's going away, it's going to atmosphere, and you will charge the atmosphere, and then, and heat up the atmosphere, and then clouds go away. That's to say water is brought away. You have wind and water goes, it goes away. And if I do this, I will have 
uh, I will bring this word, this down. I have a lot of photosynthesis. I have here 200 percent of, uh, shall to say, the area is 200 is 200 percent shaded, and the area here is perhaps 40 percent shaded, and so lack of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process of a, a vortex to centripetal vortex. Let's say it enters in a higher temperatures and this is a cooling down uh, process and which as well contracts and uh, afterwards at the end um, stores the energy or transforms energy in, in, in stars and in carbohydrates and at the same time the cooling down process makes that the plant doing that it drinks water because the, if you have a higher temperature of the same uh, uh, air, same atmosphere, uh, you have may, maybe 20%, 30%, 70% of relative uh, moisture of humidity. When it cools down, the uh, relative humidity goes up, and then uh, the water plant will drink. And then we have produced, we produce here a lot of organic matter on this place. And this lot of organic matter on this place makes or causes that to have a great activity that is a bit to be transformed you have listened to me that i always told the only telling of boning yeah so i have i'm in my case i'm recycling at least 150 to 250,000 kilo of organic matter per year this is more or less uh, 15 to 20,000 kilo of dry matter per year uh, as a result, I have huge fungal uh, activities. In f the, f the first ones are Basidium uh, bas These Basidium they work hydroscopically. That's to say, they create an, uh, an, uh, an environment which drinks water out of the atmosphere. Uh, at least one and a half liter of water uh, per kilo of carbon, which we... Uh, put on the soil. This is a, a, a huge quantity of water. And then I do the following. Here I'm drinking water and the water level goes down. The water level goes down. Here the water level, let's say it goes down. And here it comes up. And so we we are we have here we have a lot of water and uh, here we have always more lack of water, and the more you irrigate, more lack of water you have. And then you have another problem. For being hotter, the, the soil, then the rain which falls, the rain will not enter into the soil by, by uh, uh, how it's called, by itself, only by uh, gravity, not by, by uh, gradient. Let's say it doesn't enter by gradient, on top only by gravity. And for this, you will bring it only to this to the to the B horizon here, to the B horizon. And for this, we, we uh, and afterwards by the water will be will be brought up together with uh, the. Uh, um, yeah, by by uh, it's called. Yeah, it will uh, it come up, brought up together with the salt, uh, which had been deposited, uh, capillarity, which had been brought uh, uh, deposited by life during perhaps thousands of years in a subsoil, the sea horizon. They come up, and you will have afterwards this compacted B horizon which once again a reason that most of what we have from rain is, is uh, we have runoff. And we see that whole world, all places, we see the same thing. The same thing. Uh, there are two, um, um, two, two uh, peculiarities which are nearly uh, very close together, uh, related, which is um, flooding, and drought, 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 flooding. That's to say that the soil doesn't drink more water. 
and you intoxicate this. So when I began, I had this situ situation here, only without trees, and then planted trees. And this had the consequence, big scale, yeah, big scale. Uh, I have planted uh, in the beginning, in one and a half year, by my own hand, yeah, uh, 350 hectares of forest, only by seed. Only by seed. I had to tell you that I have, I admit, it does me that I had six to six, uh, six to seventy people in the first year, first one and a half year, doing all by hand, cutting grasses, cutting herbs, and preparing a little bit. And at night time, I, I went in order to distrib distribute seeds. This resulted that after ten years, uh, the precipitation rate raised. From the medium at that reach in the beginning was 1,600, oscillating from 1,000 to 2,000. It went up to 2,000. In the region, it went down because the, the, uh, they cut a lot of wood. In the meantime, in the bigger region, it's 900,000 because no more, nearly no more forest. On my place, we have a lot of forest, and so we have 2,500 millimeters of precipitation and the radiation of uh, our climate to, to the outside, to the western part, we have this, the rains of the eastern side, close to the, to the uh, Atlantic, 30 kilometers and so, rain from the eastern side, the main rain southeast, east, southern hemisphere, yeah. And uh, so to the western side, more or less seven, eight, nine kilometers to north, one kilometer south, uh, one kilometer to and to east, a little bit less. Uh, increased rain, and on our place, let's say in the center where I'm working, um, we have every day, all year long, we have a lot of uh, dew at night, at 8 o'clock, uh, begins to drop down to the soil, even if there is no rain during one month, or two weeks at least, or one month, in a region, plants begin to, to suffer. and. Uh, two months without rain or uh, strong uh, deficit of rain, plants begin to dry. Our my plants don't dry. Uh, they are dark green, and every night they drop down a lot of water to the organic matter, and giving uh, possibility for the uh, for the for the basidium to do their job. And so uh, the plants they bring their roots to the. Uh, that to say, they send their roots to the uh, organic matter in order to get their uh, elements. That's that's to say, their, yeah, their elements. And so uh, now you tell, well, this is good, uh, this small scale, but I have to do it rapidly. Well, do it a little bit faster. I did it in Toka Farm too. Uh, they gave me a piece of land they, they didn't like because it was sand. And the uh, enterprise sugar, uh, sugar company, they returned that, gave it back, uh, that land before the end of the contract. Uh, because of uh, the non compensative uh, production of that sugar, let's say it was a big loss for the company. So they gave it back and they even agreed to pay. Uh, half at least to the farmer of what had been agreed upon. Uh, the loss uh, to pay that half would, was less than uh, to maintain Operation Sugar on the place. And so they gave me that land, that is the owner of that land, they gave me that land. And what, did, what I did, I planted invasive plants on that place. These invasive plants, they are beautiful, they are our allies. It's written in a Bible. Well, that I always cite the Bible or the old ancient Greeks, or Lao Tse. This is not that I'm Christ or something like that, but I appreciate very much the wisdom. They, it was written there, and don't try to, or say, try to understand the messages they gave and the advices they gave. Transform, written in the Talmud, transform your enemies in your allies. This is a very wise and threat and, and put in practice a very uh, lucrative imp uh, 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 enterprise, or oh, let's say uh, business. This is very lucrative. 
transform your enemies in your allies. And so plant these invasive plants. They are good. They do a marvelous job. And in that case, I used, I advised, we did it, to plant on the 70 hectares uh, brachiaria, uh, in, which is a, a blame to, to be the, the reason for the degrading of a lot of, of uh, land and the reason for known uh, reinforced natural recovering of the soil. Plant those ones. One year later, we planted them together with some leguminous plants. And one year later, uh, I cut that grass. But I, I didn't eliminate it. I only organized it in a way like this. Every three meters, four meters, I made a row of this, uh, a double row of this grass and let the grass in between. And then I planted my in that case, once again, very much criticized uh, and blamed to be the reason for the, uh, uh, the, for the pressure upon water and uh, the uh, depleting of ecosystems. Planted eucalyptus. They are criticized too, uh, but they are a marvelous colleagues. So I planted eucalyptus, a lot of eucalyptus, every meter one here and, and every meter one, no, every 10 meter one, every meter one, three meter from low, for row to row, four meter for row to row. This gives about 2,000 and something eucalyptus per hectare. And I came to the conclusion that I have, could have planted more. Uh, it would have been more useful. And then the grass in between, it continued growing, and you can cut this grass and organize it. We have machinery to organize it to this place, and so you have no weeds which disturb your, your eucalyptus growing. And you have the possibility to, to put some seeds, so you give gave the conditions to eucalyptus, and so you, have, you give conditions for some cucumber, you give conditions for bananas, and you have conditions for, in that case, sweet potatoes. So I put some seeds of this uh, seedlings to this in between here, uh, together with eucalyptus tree, trees at the same time, and manioc too, that is a cassava too. What happened that uh, we harvested after two and a half months, we began to harvest uh, cucumber. And this doesn't uh, disturb this grass here. And in order to improve system, after six weeks, you have to cut the grass once again, and then and you, you give a little bit more uh, fertilizer to that place. It's a very cheap operation. It's cheaper than herbicide, yeah? And the operation planting trees here, you need no irrigation, nothing at all. We planted uh, also. Uh, eucalyptus and citrus trees and mango tree at the opposite of the time it's being planted normally on the, those who have irrigation they can afford to plant them at the end of the rainy season and they plant it at the end of a rainy season too but without irrigation and they grew according to the uh, to some visitors we had of, of the biggest enterprise in, in that business which have about three million hectares of uh, of eucalyptus, they were astonished. Oh, your eucalyptus without irrigation, they grow faster than ours with irrigation. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Well, big scale, big scale also can be cheap, yeah? If you do it, you only, you have to adapt, or do you have to, do, do, yeah, do you have to adopt the strategy nature uses. Transform your enemies in your allies. Well, uh, so your eucalyptus operation has, uh, in this case, has an has a advantage. You can do this also with your, your, with your apple uh, operation or with, your, with other operations you'd like to do, to, to do. And then you will harvest some tomatoes in it, not only some, a huge amount of tomatoes, but a lot of organic matter. And those new eucalyptus trees, they will be the first structure they, go, they will, uh, they, 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 because they grow very fast. And they plant them together with corn. Uh, in the beginning, this very small seedlings, huh? they are small. Uh, we plant them together, it, grow, it grows faster. And this helps to the eucalyptus, a little bit of corn, and then the tomato here. And so uh, it gives the first protection to, your, to our eucalyptus tree. In the beginning, they are protected by this organic matter here. And then when they begin to really grow, uh, the, the, after three, four, five weeks, 
uh, the, the corn grows faster, and the, uh, the tomato will go to the corn, and then afterwards, after three months, she equilibrates like, like this, this, and the tomatoes will extend their uh, uh, braces to, to the eucalyptus tree, and so eucalyptus tree, small eucalyptus tree will begin to give its, its red fruits without any pesticides, without any other fertilizer, and without any irrigation. Uh, I don't discuss major, the majority of things you said. Uh, for me, it, uh, uh, the things are like this. But I would like to see examples in the uh, Mediterranean context, uh, uh, agro-socio-economic context, and uh, with different kind of ex uh, uh, agriculture explorations. I would like to see examples is the, uh, and in short and long term. They will be very good in long term, I will, in short term. but. I would like to see examples, but that's it. Well, it is a discussion for... Hold on, just one thing. Uh, Ryan and Karin, please. Uh, how many times you, you... How you reduced your irrigation in a place which is much drier than this one by just using organic matter in the ground and a stratified system? Yeah. They are in the south of Spain. Malaga. Yeah. yeah so we, in the south of Spain, um, in the province of Malaga, right on the coast, and we receive about 250 millimeters a year, sometimes a little bit more. And um, I used up, I did put drip irrigation in, but just one line of drip irrigation. Um, for the trees, I didn't have to irrigate pretty much at all. For the vegetables, yes, a little bit, but only one one drip line in the center of a vegetable bed. That's it. Also, just, oh, uh, just by having the, the trees so stacked closely together, um, compared to other areas on the farm where we had to irrigate two or three times a day even, we we're irrigating the annual vegetables maybe once a week. And I think we actually overwatered. <laughs> that is a desert where you live. Yeah, it's semi semi arid. Yeah, it's very hot. Uh, well, look, you ask now in big scale, uh, as well annuals as as uh, perennials. Uh, from the moment on that you produce organic matter on the place, it grows very fast. At the moment, you plant. We have planted. I hope you have planted. Uh, your your barley and uh, your uh, your uh, veg and your um, uh, oats and other uh, winter weeds or weeds uh, crop and they would be now 20, 30, 40 centimeters high with uh, uh, with the rain you could save free house free farm without any irrigation only do it at the, at the correct time. Perhaps it will be higher even, but at least this you will have in Malaga in that uh, situation. You'll have 30, 40 centimeters now high. Until March, April, uh, it's quite high. You please use uh, long straw varieties to do that, you know, to produce organic matter and plant vegetables to get and prune them. And then uh, in March, April, before they are ripe before the last rains march. You will, you can cut them and bring them to the to your beds, to the beds of your tomatoes, which we have uh, established, or I hope you have established at, uh, at up to that time, and your uh, red pepper, and other operations you have done at that time. You will organize that organic matter in order to decrease, let's say, to diminish drastically uh, irrigation as uh, Ryan now told, let's just say, uh, Karin told that once, uh, a uh, uh, once a week or two, two weeks instead of thrice a day, three times a day, and only drop irrigation. So uh, you do that, and then in March, the first year, it's all bare land, uh, land still. You have planted a lot of trees, as I do. I hope you, you have done it. And plant a prickly pear, too. And then I hope you will plant intelligently, plant Sudan grass, or uh, summer grass, summer herbs, which will uh, give you organic matter without irrigation. 
with a low 350, 400 millimeters without rain between end of March, April until October. Uh, Sudan grass, I've tested in different situations as well in Africa as it's in, uh, in other places in Americas, and they do, they do quite well without any irrigation. They will, that you can cut them three or four times the summer, and it grows vigorously. Do it. It's only a question of do it. Let's just say, uh, buy some seeds. It's not very very expensive. And then think about machinery you use to cut them. Don't use the raw machine in order to kill them. Use the machine in order to clean them, to, to cut them clean. And then organize organic matter to your plants and, count, and plant them densely. And so you have, uh, on your paths, you will have this grass growing and protecting. And then you have this situation that's the same state of heating up the place, bare soil, uh, 50 degrees, 60 degrees in summertime, it will, you have temperature uh, about 40, 20, 24, 25 degrees, which makes a big difference uh, in terms of, of, uh, and, uh, of uh, loss of water, and then the protection in the surrounding, uh, that's to say, close to your plant, it will it, it modify a lot. You will have here organic matter, and then here organic matter too, covering the soil, to outside a little bit more, and don't make a heat because it, it would heat, heat up. Learn from nature and to give them a nest, or give them a double uh, Row of of uh, that organic matter, and then so you have uh, protected your soil, and need no more irrigation or only minimal irrigation, and this will make that you have less pressure underneath, and the, the root system they will be able to uh, get water from down to up, and then I hope you will have listened and will put this in practice, if you plant that use or tomatoes, please plant trees. Because if you plant trees, the same cost you have to irrigate and to fertilize your uh, uh, lettuce and housing, you could plant trees in an intelligent uh, uh, way. Let's just say you plant trees every, let's see, every three meter one, one uh, tree, which gives more or less uh, 3,000 or something, 3,300 trees per, per hectare. You have, and the irrigation you, you give for your for lettuce, uh, operation tomato operation, will be more than sufficient to establish your white poplar and other fast growing trees. And then at the end of the harvest, you will, we will prune them, they will grow. I'm sure, no, I'm sure I know this for, for, uh, for, for experience. They will grow at least four meters or five meters high between March and September. You will have a lot of organic matter next time. And then you will have, you can, you can do what I, I told you, we prune them. And you prune them and you plant once again. This time with the root system underneath and the soil loosen. So, with the time, after a few years, you make you can forget to work your soil. You will have organic matter and put the seeds upon the soil, which is perhaps more intelligent because this is foreseen by nature. Big scale. One question here. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Nuno. Uh, I have a land in Monchique, uh, six hectares, and it's composed by uh, between an altitude of 400 I'm here, 450 and 600 meters high, and it's composed by half of the property is forest with many uh, rocky, uh, and uh, the other part is terraces. And uh, this forest part is uh, mainly oaks and eucalyptus. And last August, everything burned. Um, my question is, what's the best strategy in terms of uh, uh, food production, water retention, and uh, supporting wildlife? Um, uh, what what will, will be the wisest strategy in, in these conditions? Well, well, the wisest strategy is forget uh, the water, uh, the um, production. The what? 
term production. <laughs> and the first will uh, we should ask how I can be useful on that place, how I can be how uh, my intervention will be serviceable to the place, and then if you do that, things will will change. Because as long as we think in production, let's say produce, they will refuse themselves. I wouldn't be... Uh, it's not I, commercial, it's for self-sustainability. It's not a question of if, if, if it's for self-sustainable or for, for self... Uh, for you, or for, see, it's for selling. Only the, the idea of thinking to have... to, to, to make that somebody produce, this is an error. Uh, philosophically an error. Uh, if I submit you, or somebody submits you to, to produce, you will feel yourself very sad. Plants do the same thing. They, they feel themselves very sad. Try first to be serviceable. How, what can I do so that my intervention, my presence, will be beneficial to the submitted ones? Then this is only philosophical, yeah? Okay, fair. So, secondly, what I would do if I had the problem of fire. The problem of fire, you are involved. Because you didn't manage your system in an intelligent and in appropriate way for Mediterranean climate. The problem is the neighbors also. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> no, don't blame the neighbor. <laughs> Don't because blame from five years I've been <laughs> trying to, to work Don't out. blame neighbor. Imagine now, if you would have done what I, what I recommended in the introduction, so you would have an evergreen vegetation on the soil composed of Spanish broom, or let's say of broom, or cenistas, and maybe uh, rosemary and other ones, and you would have pruned them at the end of summertime, that's the beginning of rainy season. And so you would have a rejuvenated green cover until, until March, April, and all summertime you would have a, a, a dark green, prosperous uh, vegetation on the soil. And if you would have acted with your eucalyptus tree intelligently, you would have pruned them to, let's say, cut the lower branches and perhaps top them because if you top them, you what, know what is topping. What height? Uh, the height. If you ask uh, the owner of the sawmill, he will tell you. Well, five and a half meter is what is the, uh, is the best way to do this because five and a half meter topped uh, periodically every year. This results in more dense. That's the intenser wood results in, in uh, straight stems, and uh, the wood will not bend, nor split. So we will have, you would have a, a high quality of wood, uh, big production, and could prune those trees every year, once or twice, and then plant, if we do it, not in summertime, in winter time, let's just say between October and January, and plant at that moment uh, potatoes or tomatoes or whatever you want. And they would be useful, but you have forgotten to do it. You could have done it. And then underneath, you, you should have, let's say, just underneath them. Eucalyptus is a, is a good neighbor for uh, many uh, fruit trees. Maybe even, no, no, it's not a question of even. Uh, an olive tree, it's not uh, a merchant tree, it's only a canopy tree, and it stands without any problem. Uh, a, a bigger tree upon conditioned that you prune them, that big tree every year in December or January, or in between October and January. So you have to do it. And then your olive tree will be very happy. Uh, we produce more. And so the same thing with your with your almond trees and your uh, uh, also uh, uh, canopy tree or on your at the high at the uh, sea level 500, and so it may be apple apple trees and pear trees upon, uh, depending upon the, the situation. Pear trees merchant, yeah, it needs no purple upon. 
But as long as this uh, pear trees doesn't occupy still, we said, so we'll basically plant other ones too and we'll prune them. And then underneath, if you have uh, uh, pear trees, you should have uh, plums, uh, or let's say some of the of the, uh, the prunus family, not only some. And under underneath, you should have still your uh, pistachio or other plants. And so your ecosystem would be very different. That's to say, the last pruning you do is January, February, and then chop it up. And so the uh, the, the the plants would, or let's say, the, the basidium isetas would digest it and would create a humid situation on your place. And these prunes, I, I uh, recommended you, if you pro would prune them at that price, would be this high. They would not burn. Not at all. Because the new broom, all the pasture of new broom, they will not burn. And if it is old, then it will burn, because then it becomes fibrous and, and dry, and it's, it doesn't go more. Uh, and so the same thing with uh, rosemary and other shrubs. They, wouldn't, they don't burn. It, conditioned, you have pruned them, that's just a broom, just on, on ground level, nearly ground level, and clean cut in November, December, or January. They, until March, April, May, they will be dark green, full of water. They will not permit a fire burn your place. And so you have forgotten to manage your place. It's not the, the fault of your neighbor. Don't blame your neighbor. Do your, do you what you should do and plant a uh, prickly pear perhaps in between. It makes it as well. It, perhaps a little bit too cold for prickly pear. But a plant, do all, you know, to have it green, your place. And green, not only green. Uh, in summertime, in Mediterranean climates, no discussion. All should be green. Um, juicy green on, on the ground, that's to say, in between shrubs and herbs, which uh, maintain green. In the first, second, third year, as long as those, those uh, shrubs are not yet big enough, you will plant uh, plants, as I told you, for example, that, that uh, I told him, he should plant in the first year for summertime, for example, that Sudan grass, which remains green during all the summertime, and you have to, you have to cut it. At each time it begins to flower, it's flowering, you have to cut it in order to stimulate it, to, to, to return growing, and that and it returning growing. It uh, invests in new growth, that's to say, it, it alters the, the, its, its mycorrhism to a mycorrhism which is, uh, which is uh, uh, let's say, which creates a, heteros a heteroscopic environment that the soil begins to be, to, uh, be uh, becomes heteroscopic. Whereas if you let it to ripen, to flower to ripen afterwards, it uh, transforms, that is, it modifies uh, its mycorrhism to, uh, to avoid, uh, let's say, to, to expel water, and it becomes dry. And so you have to uh, intervene. It's not uh, being lazy, looking there, and then blaming uh, uh, your neighbor or, the, or another one for fire. Well, for the first time, 30 meters tall, a farewell mole of them, and then after, do it in November or October, in October, and don't do it in March and April or May. No, it, no it, has, it should have been done. Uh, but you, still right now, you can do it, yeah? And then it will copies until April, May, it will be this height. And when it's this height, you make the selection for the best of the, of the shoots. That's to say, the, like the best ones. And the other ones, let's say, this will be, if you would have done this uh, some weeks ago, in January you will do that operation, and then you have organic matter a little bit in order to raise your tomatoes together with, with this eucalyptus. And don't burn that material, chop it up, use it for organic matter, plant, plant potatoes, and uh, in January plant, can plant also the, the no, in general, in your place is February, March. You can plant your tomatoes also. It will, it will work very well. And then you let grow it up and plant at that time. In between your eucalyptus trees, plant all the uh, fruit trees you would like to have on the place. And plant more eucalyptus trees in order to raise more other trees. 
Yeah. Okay, uh, people, uh, one last question before we stop uh, for lunch. And just to remind you, we'll come back at 2 o'clock, so Afterwards. the discussion will continue Afterwards, and the discuss. debate will continue as well, because as soon as we enter in the large-scale debate, uh, as the principles are the same, uh, the questions, it's, uh, I mean, it will be answered as well, so we'll continue in the same subject. Uh, we'll pick someone from this side now, uh, that guy, and, and you in, in the afternoon will do as well. I have a question about cows. Like, if I want to implement a system, but there's cows on the land, like, how should I separate them from the system at the early stage? Because uh, early on you said that they didn't eat uh, the little trees. So uh, this is a question because the fence, like, if the land is very big, the fencing is very costly in terms of energy and money, you know, to implement it. So, yeah, that's my question. If I really need to separate them, if I can include them, if I can have another way of separating, if, if they're a problem. Well, uh, there are two. Uh, different, let's just say, I can observe it or look at your problem from these different aspects. For once, there are not cattle, uh, cows on your land. You have put cattle, decided to have cattle on your land. This is the difference. You have decided to have cattle on your land. And so, it's you, it's upon you to create agroecosystems in that your cattle can be useful, serviceable to the system. And so, not the cattle is the problem, it's your problem. Problem. You have to resolve it. Yeah? Or take off the fences and let them, let them free or free them, and then uh, it's, it's no more your problem. It's, it's the problem of, of, of the of neighbors to hunt this, your cattle. That is resolved, too. Uh, but now... <laughs> Look it from the other aspect. Uh, you know exactly the plants cattle love and like to eat. They, in my uh, knowledge, should be in my knowledge, uh, they don't leap, uh, like your uh, sisters. And they don't like at all cardo. And they, distals. And they don't like um, Spanish boom. And they don't like either. Your uh, Ulex Europeo, this is uh, your uh, marvelous Butosho. Uh, and they don't like um, this, uh, this called um, wild, wild asparagus. And there are other species they don't like. And so I would recommend you to plant organized. I hope that you are able to do that organized. A future. A fencing, natural fencing of your place. That's to say, in, instead of using your uh, uh, plow in order to, uh, machines in order to get rid of the oppress, your uh, sisters, you will plant sisters and you will organize together with distals, together with uh, Spanish broom. And together with um, uh, Ulex Europeo, that those uh, uh, Tosho and other beloved uh, species, together with the seeds you would like of the trees you would like to have upon the land, and which will be useful for as well as for your cattle, as uh, your land and for the ecosystem. So after three years, more or less. Your distance will be recited, and then they will go up, and then Spanish broom will come too, and the Toso, uh, that to say, the Ulex Europeo will protect them so that your cattle will not eat them. And so, by the, in doing uh, two, three years, you will, if you plant every half a meter, 20 centimeters, you can use a machine. You have a machine, plant because you're told you have a lot of land, and so have a tractor, and so make. Uh, use a tractor in order to make this, a small furrow or uh, loosen a little bit the soil and to put these seeds uh, mechanized uh, on this on this future fence. This is a very 
10 meters, 5 meters, uh, one fence, and two kilometers long, I think, or five kilometers long, but every 10 meters. Yeah. After three years, perfect fencing for your cattle. And so you need no more money from the banking to, to buy uh, wire and other things to convince your cattle uh, to, not to pass because they don't like those tastes and they don't like those. Uh, uh, no Spanish broom, and they don't less even like this toe show that say that uh, that uh, Ulex Europeo and the other spiny species which will protect them. And so, you have in between them, let's say after two years or three years, three years latest, you have your fence uh, only by using the seeds which are on your front and which cattle don't like, but you like them in order to make a fencing, and so can you can do afterwards, which uh, help to, let's say, interact in a way, so that your, your operation cattle will be useful for your place. You will make a system so that they have every day, at least, or half a day, a new cell. And only after 30 days, they will return to the place. And if you would integrate in this uh, mixture of seeds, uh, species they like to eat. They like, for example, for example, I, I believe at least they like very much the leaves of of um, of pear trees, wild pear trees. They like the seeds, uh, the leaves of of uh, olive trees. They like the trees, the leaves of of um, of almond trees, and they like the leaves of many other species, even of of this terebinthus, they like them. And afterwards, once growing, and they are stratified, and you learned to manage them, you will craft them outside. That is a little bit higher than the excess of the of cattle. And so you will produce some this place. You have a, will have an operation still of of uh, olives, or you will have an operation of of uh, additionally to your cattle. You have an operation of almonds, and you have an operation of hard fruits on your place. Let's just say your and cattle likes pears. Yeah, if you craft them, and they can they could eat. Uh, cultivated pears, they are, they are bigger and they are more juicy than wild pears, and so it would be, and it's not costly to, to prune those uh, wild uh, pear trees, it doesn't, if you learn it, you will prune at least 200 per day, and 200 pear trees producing one day, uh, after 10 years, or after, after 5, 6 years, they will produce a huge amount of best food for your cattle, and if you like, you can participate on that operation, let's say, on the, on the, on the, 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 the uh, let's just say, on the surplus of that operation too, or you choose the best ones and the other ones cattle eat. And so your cattle operation will be, uh, uh, or can become, as possibility to, to become, to turn into a beneficial operation of the ecosystem, and you will come to turn into a useful, a serviceable element on your farm. <laughs> I, co I told you that you, that you can uh, uh, ask for the, for the spacing of these trees. I would make a mixture and plant them mechanically, mechanized, if you if, if it's possible. And if it's not possible, you plant them directly. That's to say, at least 100 or 200 fold more seeds and trees you would like to have in future time. Because there are these white uh, uh, pear trees, or this, uh, this uh, ambush, or that's to say, the wild uh, olive trees, they give you, they offer you every year a lot of seeds. And so the, the other species, Pitom and etc., cetera, et cetera, they offer to you a lot of seeds. And if you Spanish broom too, let's say the broom too, it offers to you a lot of seeds. And so collect these seeds instead of using your machine in order to, to, to kill them and to control them. You turn your enemies in your allies. And then you have, you'll have marvelous fencing. Every year, every half, no, every 20 centimeters, 5 centimeters, a tree growing up. Uh, and then you, by the, in, they are very grow, 
And afterwards, you can thin them out, select for the best ones. And if you put perhaps afterwards still a wire on the end of the rest of your farm, not the thick wire, on the fine. So this will avoid that they will force to come to the next uh, cell. And so, question density. Well, first, distance between spacing between the fences, I told you, five meters. Perhaps you will you have uh, uh, you'll do it three meters. I would tell you it's better than five meters. Do that, but not more than five meters. And then the seeds go together because seeds they are there. They are waiting to be planted. And if you do it a better job, even keep these seeds, part of these seeds, for example, wild pears. Give it to, to uh, the employ one of your. Uh, beloved cows to eat them and then she gives you these seeds prepared to grow and you can do it with other seeds too it will it will prepare it to, to grow uh, she does it free and <laughs> thank you very much and we almost had two miracles here that Ernest you know was right on time for us to have lunch so Guys, we'll try uh, uh, to have lunch in one, one hour and a half and then come back here you know, for the afternoon event. So, uh, Metro is a very nice place to walk around. There are many good restaurants here. And uh, if you have any doubts and need recommendations, there's going to be people. Katarina is there. She knows very well. And you can ask her for good recommendations. And I hope you are all back here at True Sharp. Okay? Have a good lunch. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosinda. Um, I am a member of the municipality exec executive here in Matala, and we are going to uh, present a process. Um, me and my colleagues, Marta and uh, Katerina, are just three of the persons that are uh, working in a process that is mainly uh, a local process, um, a, a process that started um, with a concern, with an attitude, uh, with an awareness that things were not okay, uh, that the solutions that were provided were not okay, and that we would not be um, contemplating uh, the problem. So. We are experimenting and we are doing things. So it's a process, it's organic, it's in constant change. But being local uh, doesn't mean being closed. So we want to do things locally with external uh, inputs. And that's why we do these conferences, and that's why the team from the Syntropic um, uh, is here. Um, but uh, we are aware that being local, wanting to do it local, we need support from the outside, because we are not so many. And also, we have this um, idea that maybe with our experience, we can be a good practice that can influence other territories. So it's not our ambition, but if it works, uh, maybe we can be a good practice to other territories that are more or less like ours. So this is the first thing. Um, probably along the presentation, I will uh, words. I will miss some words because. Um, my English is a little bit rusty, <laughs> um, but yeah, I need this thing, technology. And so this is uh, more or less Mertula. We are a very big municipality in terms of territory area, but we are only five uh, habitants uh, per kilometer square. Um, and 35% of our 7,000 inhabitants are over 65 years old. So 
um, population aging and um, not the not renewal of the, the, the generation is a problem in, in here. So when I say we are few, it's because we are really few. And uh, also another thing, I say 30% are over 65, but we see um, seniors as an active part of our community. They are not the, the passive uh, uh, part. They, are, they have the knowledge um, that we now need. The, a knowledge that was put in second place and that we know it's vital for the process that we are now uh, starting. So we say 35% are over 65 is because there are problems related with that. Not that they are the problem, you know, like, so something we have to say because we always say, the people are the problem. No, the system is not prepared. So they are not the problem. Uh, but things related with health, with mobility, with things, we have to be prepared for the population that we have. So all those problems. But even so, we are a territory with diversity of landscapes and habitats and a territory with huge biodiversity. We are like in a paradise, a refuge of biodiversity. Um, we are in the middle of a process of reintroducing the, the Linux. Um, and in Portugal, it was only possible here because we had the proper ecosystem and it has been a success. And it has the results that no one thought it would have. And it is because there are good people working in it, professionals working in it, but mainly because the community, the landowners, the people related with hunting that provide the rabbit for the Linux to eat, it's because of those people that the Linux is here. So. All of this is possible because we have a community that accepts, embraces this, and sometimes people forget that. So it's not conservation um, and safeguarding of biodiversity is not just a thing for the technicians, it's mostly a thing for the community. And it only happens if the communities allow it and help it. And this is the case in, in here. So we are going to do a very dynamic presentation. So we will talk, uh, I'll present, Marta will present, and Katrina will present. Hopefully it's not very confusing. So Marta will start now. Thank you. Uh, also, sorry for my English, not very good, but I will try my best, okay? <laughs> I hope you understand me. So, however, uh, um, we have all that uh, biodiversity landscape, but the truth is when we look of, uh, to our soils, uh, we can conclude what Maria José Rocho, she's a researcher that studied for a, a while uh, here, the Mertula terri territory, because we are in one of the most affected places by desertification and also the climate change also here, it's very pertinent. And she wrote that, that we have gone too far. We have broken the natural balance. We have exposed the soil to ardent and abrupt climate change. We have degraded the flora and the soil. We have created conditions for the desertification of the territory. And that did, that's it's also true in here and so whose fault it's the farmers folks it's the technicians that, that advise the farmers folks it's the european union folks because they have the rules well that's not our purpose to discuss who is the folks but what we really know it we don't have a point here of being pointing it's his fault he have to solve the problem now we have to solve the problem we, the community, we, the municipality, with the institutions, with the local institutions, with the regional institutions. Let's go far away if it's need. Let's go to the national point when we need it. But we are going showing 
first. We are going what we want, it's ambitious, but it's not impossible. And we have what we need. We have persons, we have the will to, to do it. So let's, let's try to do that. So what we are going to present is our strategy, our local strategy to fight that. We don't need that. We, we know and what, what, we, what is happening here now, what is happening this week. What is happening is that we are trying to have the knowledge, the competence, the people, the skills, the help we need to have our own strategy and then lobby with this strategy. It's possible to do different, okay? That's what we are trying to do. And so this is the soul of the project. This is a, in Portuguese, it's a poem from Alberto Caeiro. Um, for those who don't know, he's one of, I don't know the term in English, but it's Fernando Pessoa. <laughs> so, and it, I'm going to say it in Portuguese because it, it sounds different if it's said in another language. So I'll say it. Da minha aldeia veio quanto da terra se pode ver no universo. Por isso a minha aldeia é tão grande como outra terra qualquer. Porque eu sou do tamanho do que vejo e não do tamanho da minha altura. So this more or less says that uh, we are of the size of what we see and of what we are. So regardless of being few, um, we have the ambition and the will to do. So our main purpose is to bring the dignification to the rural world because that's the philosophy and the ideology we are recovering and reclaiming. Um, and this uh, um, purpose came from a local awareness and also unrest. Um, you know, we saw the problem and we are not contemplating him. And from the assumption that transition is possible and it depends in the first place from the collective will of the community, however few we may be. So this is what we are working now, the community. Because if the community wants to change, the change has more success, uh, or at least it has more chances. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be very, very difficult. So that's the name of the strategy focused mainly on the people in the community, our social capital, and our culture, our identity, uh, pointing to value our natural resources, and in there we focus on the biodiversity, on the equilibrium of the ecosystem, and also focusing on sustainability, because we need to stay here and we need to provide for, for us. So it has not only the purpose of uh, ecological re regeneration, but also recollection, uh, re regeneration for the use or for the use that is sustainable. So this is mainly the focus of the strategy and now Marta is going to talk about the different um, areas that we are versing. So how we pretend to do that? So this is more or less a resume of the strategy, but th this is a dynamic thing. So this, uh, if you come back here in two months, probably it will be changed because we are always learning and trying to improve the, the strategy. But more or less is this, that we have these points uh, of action, training and empowerment. Why? Because we understand that we try, farmers have tried for so many years to do their best, but the results that we are seeing are not the best in many ways. So we all together, the municipality, the entrepreneurs association, the technicians that are involved and the farmers, all together we need more capacity. We need to look where is the knowledge. Can we apply that knowledge in here and how? So what we are, that's one of the things that we are uh, doing. So with the community, with the farmers, with the organizations, with the stakeholders, 
empowerment of the, the community, then research and knowledge sharing. Okay, because in many times here in Mertula, we try to have more knowledge, but we cannot found it. So I think we have to study more. And so when it, if there are researchers here, please work with us, please help us, because it's very difficult to bring the research to Mertula. It's not, um, it's not close to, to Lisbon, it's not close to Oporto or to Coimbra, it's very difficult many times to bring research. We need more research and we need to share the knowledge that is done by the researchers because we don't need research for do, just doing beautiful papers. We, we need that knowledge here in the field and how to apply that, that knowledge. And uh, to, to work and uh, pass this knowledge uh, uh, peer-to-peer -peer also, because that's uh, quite important also. Then we have uh, to create value in the territory. We must produce. We, as Rosinda said, we don't want just a beautiful landscape uh, for tourists to come and see beautiful birds. We don't w want that. We want that people that are here can live actually here and feel they, that they are alive, that they, they belong to somewhere. Okay? That, that they... they don't need to go away if they don't want, okay? So for that we have, we are, uh, 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 the idea is to use the concept, concept of regeneration through the use, okay? To conciliate what we can do in the fields with the regeneration of the, the fields. Uh, we are also working in a, a Mertula, what we call Mertula Food Network, that is trying to regenerate also the, the vegetable gardens that we have here in Mertula, a lot of them, many of them are abandoned. And what we saw is that when we try to regenerate them, to produce food, actually we have quite good results. So why can't we use that food and use that all abandoned gardens to produce food to ourselves, to our children, for instance, yeah? Then we have a market strategy that Rosinda will talk a little bit more. It, and it's a, more about buy local, the communication and networking. Everything that we are doing in this process for some time, we are taping everything and creating with these uh, um, tools to disseminate. But it's also for us to monitorize and to observe and to understand when we are not going in the right place. And then we learn and do again. Okay? And uh, uh, well, that crossed with the other step, this monitoring uh, and partnerships for better results. Okay, so we need monitoring. We want and we are involving independent ex experts and observers. Why? Because if we have good results, then we can do lobby. Then we can try to uh, influence the public policies with concrete results. So it's quite important for us that what we are doing, it's have an monitoring, observation, and have, we, we observe these results and can do lobby with them. So now we are going to present some examples of uh, actions uh, that we are uh, doing in each of the um, domains that uh, Martula, uh, Marta talked about. So um, this is an example uh, on how we can uh, work with the community and share knowledge and, and also implicate the community. This photo is of an activity called uh, At Night at the Market. I don't know if uh, some of you were at night, uh, last night at the market. So basically we gather people in the market at night um, and we talk about something related with the, um, the community, mainly around food, themes that are around food, because uh, one of the str strategies is uh, um, to work with food and, and, and how food can implicate uh, in all these processes. So uh, we are trying to um, uh, sen sen sensitize um, uh, people um, to change their food habits and to return to the local food habits that were much more sustainable. So we talk about that in the market around food because 
uh, when we say there's going to be food, always people come. So uh, it's a good way. And it's normally full. And then we communicate, uh, we talk not only during the talks, but then uh, when everybody starts eating, uh, parallel talks uh, occur. And uh, the strategy, the process was, were, was born there. So it's been a year that we have uh, uh, done this. And the first um, session was about climate change. And I don't know the name in English of the the, um, the campaign of the slow movement. Fight, uh, fight, fight climate change with the fork. Yeah. So that's the main. Uh, that was the first uh, campaign we did there. So the talk was about there, and then we have done uh, plus than 20 uh, uh, talks around food in the in the market, not only in Mertola but also in another market in Mina de San Domingos, in a smaller community. And we are now applying to um, um, renewal and rebuild uh, an old market that it's closed in an even smaller community to bring these talks uh, there. And people come, they, we also have this bring something and people bring something to share and, and it has this rule. It has to be seasonal uh, uh, and it has to be local. And uh, you have to think about the Mediterranean diet and bring something connected with that. So people have to think and they'll bring it. And if you were there yesterday, you saw a lot of things uh, that people bring in the table. Normally we have a, tail, uh, a table or a, a place for people to put the things uh, that, they, uh, that they bring to share. So. You probably saw it, the ones who were there. So it's very good because that's a very uh, horizontal communication and uh, people are not um, shy and they talk about everything when they are around food and with some good wine, everything, well, the talk flows. So all of this came from, from that. But then after this, you know, we just tell them things, they are curious and then it's the other work that comes next. And this is what Mark is going to talk. And then we've got, it's more easy to get their confidence to do other things uh, with them. Uh, and so yesterday there were some few of them. There are not so much, but they talk with each other and they are <laughs> seeing what we are, we are doing. And today there is four farmers uh, in the English day. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's important this kind of thing is that when we have other strategies for the capacity and empowerment and that can be in a room, can be uh, talking with each other more peer to peer or in, in training courses like in Freixo do Meio there were eight students or farmers in the, the, the course of Syntropic Farming in, in October and we went to them also to Alvalau to know a restoration project in, in Spain in a similar but worse conditions we thought let normally everything that we show them they said oh yeah but they don't have the problem of the draw that we have oh but they don't have the soils that we have so we found the worst place then <laughs> then as we say okay let's take them to see and let's see if they're going to say oh but they're so so we went there that's the <laughs> and it was really nice because uh, first of all because it was really a good opportunity to communicate and I think that was the most important more than what we were going to see was the opportunity to be with each other farmers technicians the executive of the municipality to speak with each other and discuss the problem and then when we arrived together in the bus to Mertula and we went there in Mertula they all just do Oh, this is so beautiful, so good, it's a paradise. <laughs> because it was really, really worse. And I think this is, this is a continuing process, okay? That's not a phase that will finish. That this is the most important phase in the process, that the learning together, learning and sharing process. So this will be a continuing process. And since it is a continuing process, this is... Uh, uh, project we are applying today to submit the appliance so 
there's a team working hard for that. Um, this is a project we have to create here, um, a research and training uh, place for the academy, for researchers, uh, for trainers to come to Martela and have the conditions to stay for short, long periods. Uh, we'll have lab laboratories, uh, places for people to stay. And this is the place. This is uh, an old, um, I don't know the term in warehouse warehouse connected with cereals. You see them all over the place in Alentejo. So it's quite symbolic because cereals were one of the main um, reasons for the state that we are now because they had to cut a lot of trees and it was a, a, an intense production. So it's kind of symbolic that we want to cap capacity and capacitate train our farmers and our community to a tran transition model that uh, has its knowledge center, I would say, in a building that was the center of the beginning of the desertification, I would say. So it's also symbolic for that. So this is a place where uh, we want people like some of you to come and spend time um, teaching us and also sharing uh, knowledge with us and probably, and I think we will also give you a lot of knowledge because it's a sharing process. So we are creating the conditions for this to happen more often. Uh, and this is, like Marta said, a process to continue it. Um, and it's just the infrastructure and it's going to only happen in the future, but we are creating the social capital for, for, for that to not be an empty building, okay? Uh, okay, then it is not just about learning and projects, we really got to act. That's, uh, of course, quite important. So I, I already talked about it. We are uh, uh, doing this Mertula food network. We are identifying what are the vegetable gardens that are abandoned, trying to understand why, what they, what, the, what of that gardens can be uh, available for new farmers or for the owners if they, they want to, to work with us in this project. And it's, uh, uh, the idea is to have a collaborative producer network and to uh, to put these foods on the the canteens of the the schools and the pathway here in Matula. So, as Marta said before, to someone of you here in the back, you're invited to collaborate and, and come here. And I've been reflecting: what are these kind of qualities of people that we need here? And I can think about many, but I I thought about at least three. The one quality is very much linked to what we are talking about now here. It's about those people that have and share the passion of being really stewards on the land, that want to be those that um, really manage um, the land in the way that we have invited Ernst to really share with us all what he sees would be needed here in this ecosystem. So this is, I would say, the, the real quality of what, what, what is needed here. And I think I, I can say that they are invited to come here, right? We have them already, but they are invited to come here. And the second quality of, of people is probably those that come in with a certain creativity, because in many of the discussions that we are having on that beautiful journey with the farmers from here and with many of us is, but how? If I want to go on that pathway of regeneration by use within the current paradigm of the economic system, how can I do it? And, and how can I do this in surviving, in, in, in building like an economic reasonable way of doing that? So the second quality is really about creativity of, of creating value chains and creating value networks. I think we can't stay with the linear value chains, but more networks of collaboration, of creating value of those plants and things that come out of these areas that um, make or help us to, to create value in the region and, and those plants. And we are already doing that. So it's like the prickly pears we have been 
hearing about. It's like the bolota, the acorn. So what is needed in order for us to, of this wonderful abundance of plants, um, to, to, to create value out of them? And that's exactly the points when to, to, to share and, and um, experiences about that, how to create value. Uh, the third one is um, the one about collaboration, because of course we can't do it alone. Mertola can't do it alone. Um, Alcotin can't do it alone. Alvelal, we heard in Spain, they can't do it alone. But also, I think there are new relationships between the, these places here in the European South and the European North. We need each other and we need to find new relationships. So those people are needed that can build the bridges and can, can collaborate. And the beautiful thing is, during this journey with Ernst, we know that there is already knowledge, experience, even technology to do agriculture differently in a syntropic way. And I would say the same is true for co-creation and collaboration. There are processes out there and there's experience out there how we can integrate all these new uh, feedback, input and diversity of people. And when I reflect about this last week, who was here and who is already after all that work of the people here in the community and of all of us and this team over the last year, I would say, or more than a year. If I reflect all these elements, we have them already here in Mertela. We have them in this room even. Yesterday we had them in the room. So what do we do with the diversity? And I think what is now the next step is really to, to handle that with a lot of care, with a lot of love, and to really bring together the things that we all need and these qualities and these people to move on and rely on trust and not be shy to commit errors because that's where we learn from. So, <laughs> no. I don't know why the biodiversity is written, but it's going behind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, just to finish, we, we finish with this citation of Samuel Beckett because we all three, and maybe some of you also feel feel the same, that it's ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. So I believe, for instance, Antonio, that he's already trying to do some syntropic experience. For sure, he will fail. <laughs> and Ernst will come here and say what the hell he's doing, it's nothing, he didn't learn, <laughs> no matter. Then we understand what was wrong, we do it again, no problem. And it's not on the farm, it's in all the process. We are continuing in all my 14 years. Uh, we both were invited, we are not from here. Many people are here fighting and fighting and also many times doing wrong, but doesn't matter. We learn, we'll continue, we'll do it, and we'll do it better. And we count with all of you that can help us. Please help us, okay? Thank you.